All right, hi everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about Julia binaries, uh, what the status is, where we've been, what has happened, what we are planning to do uh, still. So, you know, in, in Julia, we love interactive development and we have this great REPL where you can just type and get results uh, as you go interactively and that's all great, we all love that. Uh, but people ask me all the time, well, can I build a binary like GCC? You know, where I, if I want to make an executable or a, li a library to hand off to someone. Uh, well, we have a, a solution to that. There's this package called packagecompiler.jl. Uh, how many people have tried it? A lot of people. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it uh, in this talk uh, with this very exciting example package here where I have pretty much the simplest thing you can possibly imagine. I have a function of two integers that does x plus y um, because I'm going to look at it from the angle of how, what is, what's the minimum possible. Uh, so we'll look at the overhead, you know, how, how small uh, can, can a binary be. Um, so this is the, the sample package I'll use. So we can do that by using package compiler and then I'll use the create library command. Uh, you just give it the package and an output directory. And in order to give kind of the whole story of, of where we've been over time, I went back to the tool chain as of roughly Julia 1.6. So this is that era of, uh, of the tool chain. And if we run this, it outputs a directory, actually, which has a, a whole bundle of everything you need to make this library usable. Uh, and if you ask how big is that directory, you find it is an incredible 900 megabytes. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> Yikes, all right, so if you, if you saw uh, the talk this morning by uh, Martine and, and Julian, who have tried to do this, they, I think they got something like two gigabytes uh, in the case of, of their package. So um, you, you see that this, this happens. So what is going on? Why is it so big, right? What is, what is in there? Uh, this is not really a reasonable size for computing X plus Y, right? So what's going on? Uh, what, how have things improved, if at all, uh, since 1.6, and what else can we do about it? So this triggers, of course, the age-old desire to, to make things smaller. All right, well now, not to be too defensive, but I do want to mention briefly that some binaries are in fact large. But big, big binaries are a thing that, that happens sometimes. So for example, uh, consider a BLAST library, which is, this implements just matrix multiply, you know. The quotes are because matrix multiply is actually very rich and complex, but here is open BLAST, which basically just does matrix multiply, uh, and you see it's at that one library file uh, is 33 megabytes. So that is pretty big, right, for, for multiplying matrices, but this is a thing that, you know, is widely used. Uh, if that's not impressive to you, here's another, uh, piece of scientific software. So this is the DL2 finite element software. Uh, it's a pretty uh, robust and uh, popular scientific software package. Uh, if you install this, it produces a .so file that is over 400 megabytes. So big binaries do happen sometimes. So we're, we're not the only ones who have big binaries. That's, uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, again, not to be too defensive, but binaries are big sometimes. So just so you should be aware of that. Uh, sometimes you do need a big binary if you're doing complex things. Um, but why does this happen? So there, uh, part of the reason for this is just a pattern that occurs in numerical computing. So here is the, a classic uh, excerpt from the LAPAC manual uh, by Jim Demmel and Jack Dungara, where they point out that numerical computing is hard because you have so many different combinations of things that you need to handle. They're for, for all problems, for all matrix types and shapes, for all data types, for all machine architectures and communication topologies, for all programming interfaces, provide the best algorithm, right? So there's this very nested loop of different kinds of implementations that you need. And this is one of the reasons. In fact, this, this tends to happen uh, in this domain. And this, this is the reason why the BLAST library is big, right? Because there are so many different cases to handle. You've got multiple data types. You have different shapes of matrices. You have different CPUs, um, et cetera. So that, that's, that's one of the reasons that that library is big. It's probably one of the reasons that DL2 is big. And it's also one of the reasons that uh, Julia binaries are big. There are more reasons, of course, but this, this is one of them. So this is something that just tends to happen uh, in this domain. 
uh, okay, so I'm making excuses, but you know, sorry, it's still, it's still just too big, right? So what's going on? Okay, I mentioned we do have the, you know, the combinatorial specializations, and that thing, of course, is part of the way Julia is designed, right? That we are designed to specialize functions on all the argument types. So as part of the way the language works, we do tend to churn out all of these specializations. Uh, so that's, that's part of it. And it's also that uh, you know, building a binary can mean a lot of things, right? Make files are complicated. There are actually lots of variables. There are lots of parameters. You know, do you want, uh, do you want debug information? Should you bundle the dependencies or not? And so on. Uh, and what we do in package compiler is basically try to pick a good set of defaults for you. So we are very strongly biased towards producing a, a bundle that will just work. So you can just hand someone that directory and have a pretty good chance that it will just work uh, without getting uh, you know, version conflicts and, and stuff like that. So we have to kind of you know, pick, uh, pick something that we think will work, as opposed to you know, if you have more control over the environment, you might be able to pare down some of that and remove uh, some of those extra dependencies uh, if you know that you don't need to provide them. Uh, and then, of course, you know, Julia, Julia, like Python, is sort of a batteries-included language. When you, you download the standard distribution, uh, and there's just a lot of stuff already in there for you. Uh, so it's, there's just, it just includes a lot of stuff. It's just sort of the style of the system. But, uh, but we're working on it. So despite all of this, the binaries can be smaller, and we're working on it. So it's, it's time to apply the, the shrink ray. So what can we do? All right, well, the, the first thing is, fortunately, this has improved a little bit just magically over time. So if you upgrade to just the newest uh, version of the tool chain today, and I just repeat the experiment, it's actually already down to 340-some megabytes. So it's still very big, but that's a huge improvement, right? So it turns out we were just doing some stuff in kind of a just simple and naive way. If you, uh, if you used a package compiler with a locally built version of Julia, we basically just took the entire library directory and just copied it, uh, which was just a very coarse-grained approach. And we now have uh, an implementation that goes through and figures out exactly what dependencies are needed, and we only copy the libraries you actually need. Uh, so that just cuts down a lot of stuff. Uh, and now it's, so now it's down a lot uh, to just 300-something. All right, what else we can do? Uh, so we also added this option uh, called filter std libs. So another legacy thing in Julia, we traditionally had all of these so-called standard libraries, uh, which are included in the default system image. Uh, and, and that is very convenient, but it produces kind of an awkward situation where people can write package code that just assumes those will be available uh, without explicitly depending on them. So um, in order to be sort of compatible with that, we had to sort of be conservative and, and uh, also provide all those standard libraries when you use package compiler. I think this is kind of an obsolete concern nowadays because most people have updated their packages to actually declare all the dependencies they have. So I don't think this is really a problem anymore. Um, and we just added this option that I think you should basically always use uh, with package compiler that just removes standard libraries that you don't explicitly ask for. And so that will, that will remove uh, quite a bit of stuff um, because you, you usually don't need all that stuff. It even includes things like the REPL and the package manager, and it's just, it's just way too much. So if you do that, now we, we drop almost another you know, 80 megabytes or something, and we're, now we're down to 260. All right, let's keep going. So some more things that you can do. Uh, so it turns out if you thoroughly compile uh, your code enough, like if you have enough pre-compile statements, uh, and then you don't need necessarily the JIT compiler at runtime, uh, you can actually remove it. So we added the ability to just delete the LLVM and uh, code gen parts of the Julia runtime, uh, and then the JIT won't be available, but then you don't have to carry around those pieces anymore, because those are actually pretty large. Uh, and another thing you can do is just run the Unix strip program uh, that just removes the native debug info uh, from the binaries, because that can actually be pretty big as well. Uh, so if you're in an environment where you don't, you know, don't, you're not debugging, uh, you don't need to get good, good uh, debug information out of it, or you don't care about that, you have the option of removing that too, just like you do for C and C++. Uh, and if you do all of those things, then we get down to 79 megabytes. So we're, we're really cooking now. Okay, what else can we do? Uh, so all right, having done that, 
I'm now also going to add this uh, strip metadata argument that we implemented not long ago. Uh, and what that does is it's very similar to the debug info concern. So that will remove stuff uh, from your Julia image that you probably don't need during execution, uh, which includes things like doc strings, uh, names of local variables, source location information, stuff we use to print uh, nice stack traces. Uh, but if you're deploying it in some way where you don't, you, know, you, don't, you don't care about the stack traces that come out or you don't want stack traces or something, then you can, you can do that and strip out all of that extra information. And that drops uh, you know, another 10 plus megabytes. And so now we're, now we're down to 66 megabytes. And you can go even further. And we also have the, the so-called Julia IR, which stands for Intermediate Representation. So that's the Julia compiler's own representation uh, of the program. If we have that around, uh, we can run it in an interpreter, or we can potentially uh, you know, JIT compile it to new specializations. But if that's not going to be happening at runtime, you can delete it. So um, you can use the strip IR command to do that. Uh, and now we're down to 50 megabytes. So a little bit of progress, a little bit of progress. Here's a summary of, of where we've been. So it's a pretty dramatic drop already uh, in terms of the smallest binary that we can produce. Uh, I added this one little item at the end uh, because the strip IR option has the small problem that if you actually do uh, need uh, to JIT a new version of a function because you don't have it compiled, uh, then you have a problem. It can't, it can't run. So to kind of get around that, uh, you need to pass this compile equals all option, which will then guarantee that every method has been compiled to native code, so you don't need the Julia IR around anymore. And then that, that brings the size back up a little bit if you, if you find you need to do that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so this is, this is progress. This is pretty good. And here are just some numbers of what's in there. Uh, I don't know why I put in the numbers. You probably don't want to stare at that. This is much easier to look at. Uh, so this, this is basically where we pretty much end up with what's in one of these big uh, package compiler binary bundles. So you can see LLVM is actually a huge part of it. It's about, uh, it's about half. And that's, you know, LLVM is a very capable, sophisticated compiler. So it is, it's really complex. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big, big chunk of this. Um, and then also, of course, the, the IR and the metadata are very big chunks. And then there are a bunch of other libraries that we bundle just to make sure we have compatible versions of, of all of the dependencies. Uh, and then we have this. This is pretty much where all the action is. Uh, this is where you have the, uh, the native code that we generate and any data that you might have, like you know, constant uh, data in your programs. So OK, yeah, so the summary of, of what's happened so far. Uh, so way back, we used to just copy too much stuff that you didn't even need, so that was easy to fix. Uh, and then about 40% of these big things is actually just native debug info. So same, same thing that happens in C, C++. Uh, and also half of it is just LLVM. So there are some really very straightforward reasons why you get these big sizes. Uh, and yeah, numerical software has dependencies. So if you do any linear algebra, we're going to need to put OpenBLAST in there. Uh, you might need some other libraries like Sweet Sparse, or if you use big ints, big floats, GMP, MPFR. So those dependencies have to come from somewhere. You, could, you can possibly arrange it to have those provided on the, the host system where you're running. Um, but you know, if not, we, we are including them. So that's, that's something you have to take into account. You know, the dependencies have to come from somewhere. Uh, and then also, this, this, this item, um, so I should mention this, for all machine architectures, you know, the, the microarchitectures that are out there are getting more complex and varied all the time. Right? We have, even just within x86, you have different models of CPUs that have different uh, vector register sizes, different vector instruction sets, et cetera. So if you, if you build a library optimized for your local machine and you give it to someone else, even if you're both on x86, there is a pretty decent chance it might not actually work. Uh, or it might be suboptimal. Uh, so this is something we really have to address these days. And so we do that automatically uh, in Julia with this feature called multi-versioning, where we will actually generate multiple implementations of function bodies 
uh, that are optimized for different microarchitectures, like for different vector instructions that are available. And then on startup, we look at what CPU we ha you have and pick uh, the optimal implementations uh, for that CPU. And that all happens very magically and automatically. You don't even have to know about it. But we do have a default set of architectures that we compile for. Uh, and so that can result in some duplication of, uh, of code. So we, we basically picked a, picked a default set of chips to target that we felt would cover you know, most of what you're likely to encounter, et cetera. It's a kind of a judgment call thing. Uh, but if you know more specifically what you are targeting, you can use the CPU target option uh, in package compiler to just narrow down what specific CPU you're targeting, and then we don't have to make these copies of, uh, of functions, and that can also reduce your size. Uh, it doesn't affect the specific case I'm looking at now because there's very little there. I, have, um, I think there was just not much code that was using vector operations and such, so it didn't really make a big difference uh, in my small example, but in, for a bigger, uh, bigger package that has more complex uh, numeric code, it might make a, might make a difference. Uh, so here's a summary of the, uh, the kind of levers you have to pull. So, yeah, you can you do filter standard libs, and that drops 78 megabytes. Uh, you can remove LLVM, drops 137 megabytes. Uh, run the Unix strip command, drops 40 megabytes. Strip metadata, drops 13 megabytes. Uh, strip the IR, drops 15 megabytes. And you can also set CPU target. Um, check out Julia CPU target help for the options that are there. This is basically just exposing the options LLVM has for this, which is really quite uh, dizzyingly complicated. Uh, but uh, that's just the, the world of CPUs that exists out there. Um, and this, yeah, so this, it's a little bit awkward that these are not uh, built into package compiler. I think it would be you know, very straightforward for us to just to add options to do this for you. It's really simple, so we could just add a just to make the interface more uniform, we could just add an option to say, OK, yeah, I don't need the JIT, so just leave that out. And then these would all be you know, a little bit easier to use. But this is, this is the state of it today. OK, so af after all this, you know, what does this look like? Uh, this is basically what you're, what you're left with in terms of the, you know, the overhead, if you will. Uh, if you've deleted everything, you can, you can possibly delete today. And of course, this the .so file, the, the so-called system image, or, or the, you know, the library file that we output is the vast, vast majority of it. Everything else is really you know, pretty, pretty small. Um, we even have, so yeah, one thing to notice is that this lib, lib Julia internal, so this is the Julia runtime uh, that includes the you know, garbage collector, um, exceptions, the task system, dynamic dispatch, all of the basic runtime functions. Um, and interestingly, it's about the same size as libg Fortran and libstdc++. They're all about two or three megabytes-ish. Uh, so that's really, it's really pretty reasonable. It's not, uh, it's not overly large in itself. Uh, and I think also this, so running, yeah, we do include uh, libg Fortran today, but I'm actually not sure anything is using that. So it might, it's quite possible we can just delete this in a case as simple as the, the one I'm in here. So. We can maybe just remove that, I think. I'm not sure anything uses it. Uh, so clearly, you know, all, all of the action is just in this, uh, this library here. This is really where all the concern is. So why is that so big? And the answer is basically that the base library, which is like the, the most standard of the standard libraries that's always there, just has a lot of stuff in it. It is accreted over time. It's unfortunately very convenient to put stuff in this place. If you put stuff here, you can sort of guarantees you that every Julia programmer will have it at their disposal, which is like, this is like very dangerous and addictive. People, this is really intoxicating, right? If I put something in here, every Julia programmer is forced to have it, right? This is like, this is too much power, right? So this is, this is where we've gotten with this. There is just a lot, a lot of stuff in here. It has lots of data types and data structures. You've got dicts and sets and bit sets and you know, file I.O. and process management and I.O. buffers and task scheduling stuff and locks and the package loader, uh, regexes, sorting, rational numbers. Uh, there's a TOML parse parser in there. Uh, so yeah, my, my x plus y function, alongside that in that library somewhere, there's a TOML parser in there. How, how do you like that? Isn't that great? Yeah, UUID package is in there, uh, and in fact, also, Components of our compiler are 
implemented in Julia and are actually included in that base library. So there's actually the, the type inference and some of the optimizer code is in there as well. That's still just hanging around in there. It's not probably not going to be used, but it's, it's still hanging around. Uh, yeah, there's also some of the, the doc system, uh, logging, uh, terminal stuff. So there's just a lot of stuff in there. And that's basically what, what the rest of it consists of. So from now on, to get the size of this, the minimal binary down more, we are just going to have to chip away at this. And there are all sorts of techniques we can use uh, that we have not scratched the surface of to pare this down uh, and get you much, much smaller binaries. So, but there's a, there's a problem, though. There's, there's, a, there's a problem we hit at this, at this stage. So, yeah, what, what function does this beautiful program call, <laughs> right? Uh, because you can do this kind of uh, reflection or metaprogramming sort of stuff in Julia, right? So here I, I made an array of three characters and made that a string and made that a symbol, and I can then look up that symbol inside the base module, and so that actually gets the sign function. So this, this computes sign. Um, so the problem with this is there's no way to know whether a program really does this, right? How, you know... Looking at this program, you can't, you can't tell that it calls the sign function, because that, you know, that text doesn't appear anywhere, obviously. So in full, full generality, our compiler cannot actually figure out every function you might possibly call, because the language has features like this. Uh, so that makes it a little bit harder to just strip things out, because we can't be really, really sure that this isn't going to happen somewhere. Uh, but, I mean, all right, let's be honest. Right? Who's, who's ever written code like this? Okay, oh, 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 come on, come on. <laughs> I was hoping for zero hands, maybe one, but uh, all right, okay. <laughs> okay, so maybe it happens sometimes, but uh, hopefully this doesn't happen too much. Uh, so basically what, what we're gonna have to do is there will be some sort of an option to tell the compiler, please assume this does not happen. I promise I'm not doing this. Uh, so you can, see, you can see the functions that I'm using, and then the ones that are not used, you can safely delete uh, from the system image. Uh, so if we, that's, and we're, we're probably going to have to do something like that uh, to give you know, reasonable coverage of the language and, and also much smaller binaries, uh, because you'll still have the vast majority of, of the language. Uh, you, know, you, you only have to exclude fairly perverse stuff like this. Uh, but that's pretty much one, you know, one thing we'll need to do to, to really strip stuff down, uh, because there, there aren't a lot of other good options. I mean, you could, one, you, you could potentially you know, fork Julia and go through the base library and you know, delete the files that you don't want. I mean, that would, that would actually work. You could potentially get that to work, uh, but it's just not very maintainable uh, or scalable, so it'd be far, far better to, to do that in an automated way. Uh, where we just have to assume that you know you don't care about stuff like this. Um, so another thing we can do is uh, so we like just like we separated the uh, code gen part of the runtime uh, into a separate library that you can just delete if you don't want to use the JIT. There are some other pieces in there we could do that for, and notably the the front end, so the the part of the runtime that knows how to parse and lower. Uh, Julia code and load packages and that kind of stuff. If you're just deploying a fixed executable, you don't need that because uh, you're not going to be loading new Julia code uh, at runtime. I mean, some in some cases you might want to have the ability to do that, in which okay, you can you can keep it. But a lot of people just want a fixed executable. You won't be doing that. So we could do the same thing there and be able to remove that uh, from from the runtime. I th that you know the runtime is not huge though, so I estimate that's gonna that would drop maybe. Maybe if we're lucky, a megabyte, maybe 500k megabytes, something like that, uh, which will eventually be significant once we get down to a, a lot smaller. Uh, so we can do that. Uh, also, the uh, another piece of low-hanging fruit is the compiler component, so the, the type inference and optimizer piece that's in base. Again, if there's no new code, if you don't have the JIT around, you also don't need that. Uh, so we can find some way to separate that out. Uh, that's sort of an obvious candidate for uh, just re removing uh, for deployed executables. And that'll be a pretty a significant piece. I think that might be maybe 10 megabytes, possibly more. Uh, so that's pretty significant. Uh, and then another thing you can do, uh, getting a little bit more wild, 
people are experimenting with really, really different compilation models. So there is an interesting package called staticcompiler.jl. Anybody tried it? Anybody seen it? Yeah, a couple people know about it. Yeah, so this is, this is a really interesting package uh, that is actually based on GPU compiler, uh, because interestingly, making small executables has a lot in common with running on a GPU, which is kind of surprising. Uh, but it makes sense because the GPU is an environment where there are things you can't do. You probably don't want to have you know, a garbage collector and a JIT compiler. It's a, it's a more constrained environment. So that was the motivating case uh, where uh, you know, Tim over there started uh, writing something that could look at your Julia code and go through it and translate it to a GPU, but also in the process, you know, checking that you don't do anything that's not supported on that platform. So you can actually do the same thing for the CPU. Just tell it, look, I don't want the, I don't want the runtime. Uh, I don't want to do dynamic dispatch. I want to use a very simple subset of the language, but just target the CPU instead of the GPU. And so that is exactly what uh, the static compiler package does. So that can uh, take a program, and if you use a very small subset of the language that just does sort of C-like things, like arithmetic and you know, basics like that, uh, it will actually produce a very small binary. Um, but that's, uh, this is getting really exotic, though, because you have to you know, drop sort of the majority of, a, of language and runtime features to make that work. Uh, but we are planning to gradually make that a little bit more first class. We're basically addressing the problem from both directions. By tar you know, starting with something like static compiler, it can gradually get more capable, maybe add back in some more features, like maybe adding in the garbage collector, for example. Shouldn't be too hard. And then also, at the same time, uh, starting with the f big full language, pair things down more and more, uh, and you know, hopefully they'll meet somewhere in the middle. So I think we can, we're actually very close to doing something like uh, the static compiler approach, but in the sort of standard Julia compiler uh, where you don't have to worry about uh, that many restrictions on the language usage uh, by just compiling out static call graphs. So basically starting from your entry point, which could be your main function, uh, or if you're making a library, one of your library entry points, and just trying to trace through there and f exhaustively find everything that can possibly be called, uh, giving you an error if we can't figure out what the program is doing, uh, and then just extracting that, uh, that call graph and just compiling that piece. Uh, so I think very soon we're going to be uh, implementing some things like this. Uh, and then there are also other versions of so-called tree shaking, uh, where you try to attempt to figure out everything that's actually used by the program and delete everything else. Uh, so the static call graph is one form of that. There are other forms of it uh, where we can try to figure out, for instance, things that you never touch. Like if I never compute a cosine, uh, I can remove the cosine function, which you can potentially do even without a fully static uh, call graph. So there, there are various approaches we can use uh, in the future. And, and uh, let's see, that's... Uh, that's it. OK. So <laughs> I have a good amount of time for questions, which I might regret. Thank you, Jeff. I see a lot of hands going up immediately. Um, Max has the throwing mic. It's probably the most fun. <laughs> Was that to me? Uh, the elephant in the room. Can't you halve the size again by making the executables compressed and self-decompressing with an off-the-shelf tool? Uh, can you, yeah, can you make it uh, self-decompressing? I think you could, yeah. Using, yeah, if, if you have an off-the-shelf tool that works on an arbitrary executable, I think you could. But I think it would have to work on a shared library, though, is the problem, because most of the size is in a, is in a shared library. There's more at the back if you can just toss over the... Uh... Hey. Good catch. <laughs> OK. Thank you. So I have a question about the sign function that you wrote. Maybe in the precompilation time, you can precompute some of the functions because you know that it will be signed, like, uh, like const exp in C++, for instance. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah that's a good point. So yeah, in the, in the example I showed with the, uh, the hidden sign function, everything in there was actually a constant. So it is actually possible the compiler could figure out what that is, because yeah, everything there was actually a constant. Uh, so it would have to be some even more perverse case where it's not constant for it to really, really be a problem, which you know, becomes maybe even less likely to happen. But yeah. 
yeah, the compiler can actually figure out quite a, quite a lot of stuff. We do a lot of constant propagation, so we, yeah, we can possibly figure out a lot of things, yeah. So I shouldn't add any additional flag to control that. It, it will be done automatically, right? I, th I think it's always going to have to be an option because we, if you're doing something really uh, elaborate with reflection like that, we, we, we still won't know what you're doing. So it'll still have to be an option, I think. Okay, this, just to your right. This. Okay, so this is about way the beginning, the first slide where you showed this piece of code. I was wondering, the DLL that it generates, which specific functions are actually exported from that DLL? Because it's, yeah, it has to be a few, right, if it's an overloaded method. Uh, so, uh, well, actually, in, in this case, with, with literally what I wrote, uh, there, there might not be anything useful exported. If you were really making a library, I probably would have put at C callable in front of that, and then that would expose that as a, as a, as a visible uh, C ABI entry point. So yeah, you, in, in, the, yeah in the real world, you might have put like at C callable there, yeah. Any more? Oh yeah, over there. <laughs> Hey, so it sounds like base is pretty big, um, but if you remove stuff from base, um, does that uh, break semantic versioning? Like one of the one of the um, th one of the items on the to-do list was like move stuff from base. Well, oh yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, we, we can't uh, we can't remove stuff from base in the sense of like deleting functions permanently. Uh, we could only do that as part of a compilation process where you know, I'm making an executable, I know I want a smaller executable, I'm willing to cut things out that I don't think I'm using. It's only in that sense, not in the sense of like, permanently removing it from the project. Um, so uh, I hate to mention it, but like, would a Julia 2.0, uh, like, would, you know, if, if, you, if you had to make a Julia 2.0, would you make base smaller, put stuff in like, different libraries, make people import them, or would it sort of be, you know, this is fine, we can just do it with a compilation step? Yeah, so y yes, I would. Yeah, if, if, I were if I were doing it over or if I were making Julia 2.0, I would absolutely factor that into smaller pieces, which would make it easier to solve this problem. But the problem is still solvable. We still will be able to shrink it using uh, tools like this. Uh, so just to, in terms of reducing the size, I do think we'll be able to, to do it. But yes, I would, I would absolutely put it, uh, factor it into smaller pieces if I were doing it again, yes. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Ah, there's one all the way on the other side. <laughs> all right. Um, so I, I can see that uh, there could be uh, many flavors of, uh, uh, for the generation of these binaries. Uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to uh, standardize, uh, standardize that into uh, the configuration of your TOMO file of a project? Otherwise, I can imagine people uh, yeah, it's starting to have like a very different way of, of, of uh, generating binaries and uh, yeah, uh, that can become like uh, very specific to each project and it, perhaps it will be a good idea to have like a single place that we can define the flavor that of kind of binaries that I will uh, produce. Okay, so are you saying like uh, for per package have, uh, have some kind of settings for that package that tell us like how, what's the best way to compile this package to a binary, something, something like, like that? that. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, so you could even even you could maybe declare things like you know this package is okay for tree shaking, like this is a no reflection package or something like that. Yeah, I could I can imagine that's gets getting pretty fancy, but I could imagine doing that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. A uh, quick question, please. So uh, you showed step by step that the size of the um, uh, executable gets smaller. What about the time that it takes to make it smaller? Well, this talk is about space, uh, not time. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, could, I can briefly address that. Yeah, so the, uh, the, yeah, so the package compiler does take too long to do its work. I, I totally agree. I think there is, uh, we're kind of in the, in this, uh, we're in sort of the first step of, of the journey there. So I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit because we have not done that much to address that. Uh, so I think we're, we're, even, we're at an even earlier stage with that. Uh, so there should be possible to get some very big uh, gains there. Yeah, I think it's just doing a lot of redundant work. Is that the, f oh, there's one more. So one of the options that you mentioned is to just delete LLVM. 
I think you also mentioned under the constraints if you don't use chit, but what, how do you know if you don't use that? Like, how do you find out? Ah, ah. well, it's, it's more of just a, a, an option. So uh, if, you, if you just delete LLVM, uh, then we obviously won't JIT compile anything, uh, and anything that uh, we don't have compiled, we will actually run in the interpreter. Uh -huh. So it will still work, but it just will be slower. So it'll, yeah, it'll still work probably, but it might be slower. So if mm. you've uh, you know, uh, done enough, say, like running of your tests, uh, if you have good test coverage and you've done a lot of pre-compile statements, uh, that you're pretty confident that everything you, you know, where you spend time has been compiled, then it's probably safe to do that. Makes sense. Thanks. And then maybe while the microphone is over there, because you're the team from Delta RS there, right? Can't quite tell. Yeah. Has he answered the question you had this morning? And do well, you now, are you going to go right now and change your compilation strategy to bring your binaries down? So those are two questions, right? Like the first one, I, I don't know yet. Um, the second one, yes, for sure. We will try all, out all of that. <laughs> okay, so we, do you know which version of Practice Compiler you were using? So Matein likes alpha software, so we use 1.10. Okay. And we still use Package Compiler. So I think at least the release version for that. The latest, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, but of course, um, the timing is, is not, <laughs> is, is not, um, is not okay. addressed. Yeah, well, and, and, what, well, and one thing I'll say is if you, if you depend on something like Modeling Toolkit or a lot of the SciML packages, they, are, they have a really, really long dependency chain, and there are, you could be easily pulling in like 100 packages. And in that yeah. case, you really were dealing with kind of a different problem, because then you really just have a, a large amount of software. Uh, and it is an unsolved, uh, it's, it's, un, it's unknown how uh, features like tree shaking will affect those. Like I, I'm optimistic that maybe it will help, but we don't actually know, you know how much it will help when you're starting with like a very large uh, you know, chunk of the package ecosystem. So LLVM was definitely a big part, so that would help. Okay, are there any more questions from the audience? I think then, no. Uh, so now we have a, a short break, and then uh, there'll be another presentation here and one in the other room at 14.20, if I'm not mistaken. And let's give right. Jeff another round of applause. Thank you, everyone.